You know, as we were thinking about the message we were going to bring forth this morning, you know, I was listening to Pastor Brian's messages that he's been preaching the last couple of weeks, and last week I just got really fired up. If I could have, we had a second service, I was ready to go. <laughs> I'm sure Pastor Brian and Jeff, you guys understand that when something drops in your spirit, it's like boom, 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 boom. You're ready to go. But um, I pray that uh, what the Lord has placed on our hearts today is something that will cause you to grow in Him. It's my desire as a preacher is for you to be better than you are today in Him. And um, when we think about that, what came to my mind that Sunday is not a topic that I haven't shared before, but to share it in a way that is meaningful for you, hope, and the rest of the body, um, more meaningful in this season for you. And so we're going to talk about faith today, but not the same old Sunday school lessons we learned about faith. I think we can graduate from that a little bit. And so when we use the word faith in Christendom, we can talk about faith in different ways. I like that pastor talked about last week. Um, we don't call our walk in Christ a religion. I know society wants to label it, but we describe it as our faith. Even the scriptures describes it as our faith. Um, there is faith in order for us to be saved, and we call it saving faith. Uh, there's different terminologies or different contexts that we can use the word faith, but I want to focus our attention on, a, on, a, on an action of faith. You know, sometimes when we use the word faith, um, we're so spiritual that faith seems somewhere out there in the ether that it doesn't seem very tangible to us. We want to make it tangible to us today. Faith is not blind, like I just heard on a secular television show this week about blind faith. Faith is not blind. We're going to talk about why it's not blind, because in order to have the faith that we're going to share today, there has to be an object of our faith, and that object of our faith is the Lord. And so it's not blind. It's not something that we just wish something happened. No, there's an actionable, tangible thing that we have when we say we have faith. And um, the scriptures have a lot to say about faith in the different aspects of faith. And so I want to kind of open up this morning. Uh, Taquarius is going to read a scripture in Romans to kind of set the atmosphere of where I want to take our discussion on faith today. So if you can read Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And so we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also boast in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces patience. Patience produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Amen. When we were discussing um, this message and this scripture, we could preach the whole message today on Romans 1 through 5. Um, But that would, a a different aspect than what I want to do today. But it's the contents of this passage is something that the Lord um, shared with me about a year ago about how to apply faith. Because how in the world, as the scripture says, that we are going to boast in tribulation? And what is this, how is this hope produced when we're going through rough times? How, is, how, are, how are we confident in, in even when things seem to not go our way, when circumstances seem troubling, 
How do we produce joy and hope through those things? How has our character changed? How is patience formed during those things? It's because of faith, but faith in the object of our faith, and that's faith in God. But what does that mean? What does faith in God during these circumstances mean? Well, the purpose with, for the purpose of our message today, this is the definition that I want to give you about faith. Faith, uh, what we're talking about today, is our absolute confidence in God. Okay? Faith is our absolute confidence in God. All right? There's no way that during tribulations that you will gain patience and hope if there's something that you're not pointing that to or depending on. And that's something that you have to point to or depend on is God. It's not something blind. It's because through whatever you're going through, you can look back and you can see that there's one thing that was constant. Even when you failed, even when you made the wrong step, even when you said the wrong thing, there was one thing that was constant that God was always there and God fulfilled what he said he was going to do. And so through each trial, when we go through those things, we can see the goodness of God. That's why the psalmist David can sing the songs even when I'm in a fiery pit, even when I'm down to the ground, he can have confidence that his God is his redemption. Even when his father-in-law, King Saul, was persecuting him, even when he was abandoned in a cave by himself and his own men that he trained up abandoned him, he had the confidence, he had the faith, he had the absolute confidence in God that he would be delivered. That doesn't come blindly. We're not guessing, we're not wishing for anything, but we know that we have a God who is there for us and has the best things for us, amen? And so, this is going to be a series on faith. And that, that series, this series is faith with the subtitle of trusting in God. And so each time we're blessed to come before you, we're going to have a certain aspect of trusting in God. Today, we're going to talk about trusting in God's character. The next time we come, we'll talk about trusting in God's promises. And then the third time we come before you, we're going to talk about trusting in God's program and his timing. And so, because when you trust in God, whatever we face, we're, gonna, we're going to rely on those three things about God. We're going to trust in his character, which we'll talk about today. We will trust in God's promises. And if you want to subtitle that, his promises that we're talking about is his promises through his word, okay? And then we'll talk about his, his program, his timing. God is sovereign. God is in control of everything of this world. And he has a specific timing and a season for things. And we have to trust what he's doing in those times. Amen? Amen. And so the way we're going to uh, bring this, these messages to you is to talk about how we uh, apply this faith, especially when we receive opposition from the enemy. Now, right away, when we talk to Christian folks, the only enemy they know is the devil, <laughs> the Satan, Satan. Well, I hate to burst your bubble, but we have more enemy than the devil. Because you and I and everyone around us have this thing called the flesh, the carnal nature that is an enemy to our soul. And I dare go on the limb, sweetheart, and say that I believe that the flesh is a bigger enemy than the devil. That may be just me. But when I look out through our scriptures and what Jesus has done, according to the new covenant, the devil is defeated. 
Sometimes I think we make him bigger than what he is. And a lot of times we give him more credit than he deserves. A lot of times what we blame the the devil on is just our plain stinking flesh, which is contrary to the spirit. You don't have to take my word for it. It's in the scriptures. Because the carnal mind is hostile, enmity against God. That's what the word says. And so the scriptures have a lot to talk about the works of the flesh. You can look in the letter to the Galatians. And if you look at that list, it may sound devilish, but it's a whole lot that the flesh can do before the devil even gets involved. But for the purpose of what we're sharing today and, and, and forward, um, you can insert the devil as the enemy. You can insert the flesh. Either way, you have to have faith in God to overcome these enemies. Amen? That's why I like this next scripture in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6 is probably one of my favorite chapters in Ephesians, especially when it talks about the full armor of God. I love the revelation that the Lord has given me about the full armor of God. And I thought that this passage, Ephesians 6 and verse 16, was appropriate to what we're talking about faith, especially when it comes to overcoming trials and tribulations and the enemy. So we want to read two versions, uh, one that we're more familiar with, first in the King James. Ephesians 6, 16. Above all, taking a shield of faith, wherewith you ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And that's the King James Version. In the Living Bible, it reads, In every battle, you will need faith as your shield to stop the fiery arrows aimed at you by Satan. So I looked at that Living Bible translation, and I'm like, that's exactly what we're trying to say. In every battle, you will need faith as your shield. You know, in the King James, it says, above all. And that's because in the previous verses, it goes on talking about the full armor of God, that you will be able to withstand the enemy in the evil day. And it talks about the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the spirit, the belt of truth. But it says here, it says above all, it says you know, when all those things are you're using in your trials, your daily trials, and in, 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 in your, your struggle with doubt and fears and whatever fiery dart comes from the enemy, it says, when all of that is said and done, you're going to need faith for those things to work. You're going to need faith to hold those things together. You're going to need faith to quench those fiery darts that come from the enemy. Whether that enemy is Satan or whether that enemy is your own fleshly mind. Because we can, our fleshly mind can get in the way of God's way for us. You ever heard of the term stinking thinking? That's just fleshly carnal thinking that's contrary to the things of God can be very devastating for us, especially when we're going through trials and tribulations. Amen? Amen. You see here in Ephesians 6, it says the shield of faith has a purpose, and that purpose is to quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. Now, notice it did not say stop the fiery darts from coming. Is said to quench. Because in this walk, we can't avoid fiery darts. What are fiery darts? Let me explain what that is and let me come back to this shield of faith. Fiery darts are schemes, temptations, lies, deceptions, and attacks aimed at God's people to get God's people to shift our trust to something 
else or someone else other than God. Remember we said faith is our absolute confidence, our absolute trust in God. The fiery darts come to shift that trust away from God. So the Bible tells us in order to quench, not stop them from coming, but to extinguish them, we have to have faith in those things. It's a powerful illustration as the Apostle Paul was writing this letter. During his time, his audience would, would really resonate with the image of a Roman soldier. Because in that region of the world at that time, the Roman Empire was occupying the land. And so as far as uh, a, a big soldier military presence, it would be this of this Roman soldier. And these Roman soldiers were known for their military fighting techniques and tactics and armor. And this particular part of the armor was a shield. And this belief has been debated, but I, I believe in this interpretation that this shield that Paul had in mind was this huge shield that would be able to cover arrows coming and would be able to be, as the soldiers would flank together, they can even link shields to form a wall for protection. And the way this shield would be made, it would be made with layers. And these layers were designed because the arrows in that day often would be laced or coated with some type of fiery substance. So not only will it pierce, but it also burns. Have you ever been pierced by a lie? Have you ever been burnt by deception? And so as these arrows are shot and they come up against these shields, the shields didn't deflect them away, but they were allowed to have a little penetration, but the layers would be able to extinguish those fires. And so that's what applying the shield of faith does to every lie, every scheme, every temptation, every deception that comes our way, when we hold up our faith shield, when we hold up our absolute confidence in God, and for today's purposes, when we hold up our absolute confidence in God's character, that's going to extinguish those things that speak contrary against God's character in our lives. Amen? I love the, the word because it gives us examples, practical examples, um, for what we're talking about today. One of those examples comes in Genesis chapter 3. And it's a situation where there is a fiery dart or several darts that's going to come, come towards Adam and Eve. And it's specifically going against God's character. So I want us to read in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God says you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she said, then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. You see what happened? Adam and Eve heard what God said. This is God saying, you can eat of all the tree and the fruit of the garden, 
except this particular one. God said this. Now here comes the serpent to call, to pretty much call God a liar. It's an attack on God's character. And what happened with Eve? This, this particular passage says, the woman was convinced. So she came under deception and she bought the lie from the enemy. Even after she heard what God said, she was convinced. But why? You see, we can blame the devil for temptation, but guess what? You can't be tempted with something that's not in you. This scripture says she wanted the wisdom that it would give her. She had a desire that went beyond what God's desire was for them. And so the enemy used that, and she was able to be convinced out of her own fleshly desires. See, I told you, we can have the devil as the enemy, but our flesh is the enemy too. And But when those two team up, we're in trouble. And so why would someone lack confidence in what God said? Is because when we don't put that absolute faith and trust in God, then we will lean into our own ways and we will be willing participants to fall for deception. It's so another example in the New Testament of the great gift that we have in Jesus Christ because he's the good son that shows us the way to live with God. Where Adam and Eve fail, Jesus was victorious. So we have the scripture in Matthew chapter 4. Matthew 4, chapter, um, verses 8 through 11. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him, for the scripture says you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil went away, and angels came and took care of Jesus. You see, the enemy whether it's your mind, your flesh, or the, the, of Satan, wants to, his method of deception is to shift our trust away from God. He wants you to cast doubt on God. He wants you to cast doubt on God's word, and he wants you to cast doubt on who you are in God. You see, when, we're, when he casts doubt and we buy into that doubt, then we want to grab every, anything that presents itself as immediate gratification, which really is, is an alternative to what God wants in any particular situation. Because sometimes God's provision doesn't come right away. See, that's where our faith has to kick in. And that's why we're doing this in three parts. Number one, what has to kick in is God's character. Number two, has to kick in God's word. And three, especially, is God's timing. You have to have all three when you have faith in God. Because you can't have the first two, well, I believe God is who he is. I believe what he said in his word. But God, you were late this time. <laughs> you should have showed up earlier. I wouldn't have failed. No, God has a timing for everything. And there are situations beyond our control, things that we don't see, we don't know what's going on 
as God's provision, as God's deliverance, as God's word is coming to us, but God knows. And so when we have absolute confidence in God, it doesn't matter how long it takes, we know that God is coming. And so what happens is we have this thing that 1 John talks about, the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, and the lust of the flesh, and especially in this society today of immediate gratification. We want things right then, right now, when we want it, how we want it, and that just doesn't work with God. But when we trust him, it doesn't matter what the deliverance looks like. It doesn't matter what form it comes. It doesn't matter how long it takes. We trust God because he knows best. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And in trusting God, we trust that he has our best interest, not some of the time, but all the time. People can ask, why do you trust God so much? Because I believe he is who he says he is. I believe when the scripture tells me that he loves me and the greatest manifestation of that love came in the form of Jesus Christ and is the very reason why I'm here with you all today. There's no greater love than that. There's no greater manifestation of love than that. So yes, I trust God with all of my heart, with all of my mind, with all of my being, I trust him. But that doesn't mean that things don't look scary. That doesn't mean that doubt doesn't try to creep in. I'm not immune to those fiery darts either. But when those fiery darts are slung, I have to resort back to who I'm trusting in. I'm not trusting in the situation. I'm not trusting in the darts, but I'm trusting in the one that can protect me through it all. Amen. It brings back to my remembrance the word where it says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And it didn't say that the weapons wouldn't form, but what it said, what it, it won't prosper. Amen. Sometimes in our walk, and it seems like sometimes in seasons, we have more fiery darts than others. <laughs> but guess what? The soldiers, they have battles where there seem to be more arrows coming overhead than others. But they still had to have confidence in that shield, no matter what. And let's get out of trying to avoid those times because we can't. Those seasons are come. Those attacks are going to come. Those trials are going to come. Those doubts are going to come. But we can rejoice in those things, as the Scripture says, because we're not putting confidence, not even in yourself. I don't trust me. I don't trust me in times of tribulations and attacks and trials. I have no, absolutely no confidence in Robert whatsoever. Because <laughs> better than anybody else, I know my flesh. I have no confidence in it. But I have confidence in the one whom I serve Amen. and who I worship and to whom I pray and to whom I walk and talk with and counsel with and listen to and obey. And so when I'm able to put all those fears and all those doubts onto him, that's just like me raising up that shield to quench all those fiery darts that are coming my way. We said that this faith we're talking about today is faith trusting in God's character. What is character? If we take a textbook different definition of character is defined as the mental and moral qualities distinctive to an individual. All right? 
And when I thought about that, I'm saying, okay, these are qualities. Another word for qualities are attributes. So there has to be something about the qualities or attributes to God that I can trust in. And so if I was to bring a definition to attribute, it would be defined as a quality or feature regarded as characteristic or an inherent part or someone or something. So when we look look to character and attribute, if we take those two definitions, then when we say we're trusting in God's character, then what we're in essence saying is that we're trusting in who God inherently is. We're trusting in God's very being. He's not separated from his characters or his attributes. Amen? So there are attributes, certain attributes, and I can go on for a week of weeks and weeks talking about the attributes of God. But I just have a few that we want to wrap this up with today. These few attributes so that you can see a practical application of your faith when it comes to trusting in God's character. So I have a few attributes of God's character that's defined in his word that we can trust when those fiery darts are thrown our way. The number one attribute or number one that I want to speak of today is God is all powerful. God is all powerful. Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. What's hard for God? Nothing. Nothing too hard for God. Nothing. I know your imaginations can go and, well, no, nothing is too hard for God. So how do you apply your faith to this? When the enemy, remember, this could be Satan or your mind, flesh, tells you that God can't do anything in your situation, you can go to the word of God and it says what? No, there is nothing too hard for God. Doesn't not matter what the enemy tells you. Doesn't matter what your flesh tells you. Doesn't matter what anybody else tells you. There is no situation that you are going through or will ever face that's too hard for God. Amen. Oh, that, that dart is quenched. Nothing too hard for God. It may be too hard for you to figure out but you're not having faith in you. You're having faith in God. And this particular character said, God is all powerful. God is ever present. Psalm 139. Verses seven through 12. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the furthest oceans, even there, your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night. But even in the darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as the day. Darkness and light are the same to you. Have you ever been told that God is far from you? You ever felt alone? You know, someone just this week as I was ministering to people, few people told me how they felt isolated and alone. Or you may be isolated or alone from people, but you're never isolated or alone or away from God. God is ever present. He's ever present. That's why I like the the old footprints poem and illustration. 
that shows that when, when we think that in our, our deepest, darkest moments that God is not there, and we may in the beginning see those double footprints, and after a while we only see one, what does it say? That God has carried us through. God is never away from us. God is never away from our situation. We don't know all the inner workings that God does on our behalf, but our absolute trust in his character tells us that we may not see it or understand it, but God is always there for us. And the scripture tells us that all things, God uses all things, to work together for the what? For our good. For the good of those who love him. So that means the good, the bad, and the ugly. (laughs) He doesn't cause them, but he uses them to work for your good. That's how much he loves us. That's how much we can have confidence and trust in him. That even in those situations, God can use them to turn for our good. Now that's hard, let's be real, okay? That's hard for our finite minds when we're going through seasons of loss, seasons of trouble, seasons of persecution, seasons of whatever, you can fill in the blank. That seems hard. There's nothing too hard for God. We're living testimonies that God can turn all things to work to the good. That's why we're here today with you at Hope. Through a season of loss and transition and aloneness and disappointment, God opened the door for us to become a family. So throughout the hardships, the trials, and the tribulations, God still had a plan to turn all of that around for his purposes for our lives. Amen? Amen. This is one I think is really appropriate in the context of our society today for us to remember, is that God is just. 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be paid back according to what he has done while in the body, whether good or evil. You know, when the, the darts that come, when we feel injustice, when we feel wrong, we're often tempted to take matters into our own hands. But faith tells us that we don't have to take matters in our own hands. That a recompense will come to who? Everyone. We all have to face judgment before the judge of all judges. No one's exempt from that. So don't worry. No one, including us, is getting away with anything. We may have legal systems fail in our eyes. We may have governments fail in our eyes. We may have people fail in our eyes. But the great judge is watching and holding everyone accountable. And guess what? I'd rather spend time here on earth in prison than spend an eternity separated from God. So we, remember, we want that immediate gratification for our desires. And sometimes that immediate gratification causes us to want to see something come upon our enemies, come upon those that have wronged us. We want to see it right now. But what if that doesn't happen in our lifetime? What if we don't ever see it? We still know that the Bible says vengeance is his. He will repay 
So where we fail, God is not, does not. He's just. And it says everyone, whether good or bad, done in our bodies, the things that we have done, everyone will go before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, I don't know if that's a literal seat, you know. This is one of those things in context in Jewish society, in the synagogue, and even in a Roman society, there was this seat of judgment where high officials would sit, would, would sit on, and that's when they would hand out declarations and proclamations of official judgment. So the idea is, is that the ultimate authority is not letting anyone get away with anything. Now, I believe in the, the principle of sowing and reaping, and I believe sowing, uh, you reap what you sow in this lifetime and in the next. But don't be dismayed if you don't see justice meet in the way that you think you should see it. Because Christ ultimately is a just God and will meet justice with the appropriate justice. You can rest assured, God is just. And he cares about injustice more than we do. And so we can, faith says that God will take care of it. The last attribute is why all of us are here today, and that is God is love. Romans 8, 35, and then 37 to 39. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity, or are we persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons. Neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, Pastor Brian, it's that asphyxiating power and pressure from religion that tells people that they have calamities in their lives because God is angry with them or God doesn't love them or you're being punished from God. That is the bondage that has a whole bunch of people hurting in churches today because people have been putting themselves as judge. We just said that there's only one judge and that's Christ. And how dare us put the bondage of people's lives that God is far from them or doesn't love them or you must have done something to displease God, so that's why all these things, bad things are happening to you, that's a big fiery dart that well, needs to be extinguished. Or well, they say you cursed. Or you're cursed, which is a lie. <laughs> because in the new covenant, Jesus has become a curse for us. Galatians 3 and 13 says that Jesus Christ became a curse for us. That was nailed at the cross. Jesus said, it is finished. We'll talk about that one day too. What it is to live in the new covenant. And that God is love, not law. The spirit of love supersedes law Amen. and judgment, for God is love. 
This powerful scripture says nothing can separate you from God's love. That's the, God, the love that God has for you. So, Robert, even when you've done your worst, God still loves you. He may not approve of what you've done, but that doesn't take away God's love for you. Do, do we understand that? I don't think the majority of Christendom does. I don't, I, don't really under, I don't really believe that we understand the depths, the depths of God's love for us. We should because it's in his word. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Not to condemn the world, but through him, that gift, that the world would be saved. Whether the world would reject him or not, has n- your rejection of God has nothing to do with how much he loves you. Your behavior has nothing to do about how much God loves you. He loves you enough to compel you out of your bad behavior. It doesn't disqualify you from God's love. It compels him to draw you closer. Now, that sounds very opposite of what law tells us, doesn't it? It says that when you behave badly, you should be punished. And so those that are bound by law says that God sits there on his throne waiting for you and I to mess up. And when you mess up, he's ready to condemn you punish you and throw you away, and then you have to make all these steps in the guise of repentance to come back to him. No, that's the control of religious spirit. That's the Pharisees. God's law says, love says, no, I made a way, f- I paid for your sin already. And through my love for you, which going back to our first passage in Romans, said because of God's love, it allowed for us the Holy Spirit to be in each and every one of us that attest that God loves us, which produces a hope in us. What hope do we have if, that, if we fall down and mess up, God throws us away? What hope is there? Because that's what? I mess up every day. When people say they love us, oftentimes, sweetheart, it's because they approve or like something about us. And then when they don't like or approve something on us, their so-called love goes away. That's not God's love. His love says that I love you regardless. And I will chase after you regardless until you turn back to me. I will love you. So his way of restoring you is not to legalize, legalizingly, I don't know if that's a word, punish you. His way is to love you back. That's why When we go through those things, those fiery darts, when we go through those troubles and troubles come our way, we don't, our mind doesn't tell us, oh man, what did I do to displease you? No, when we have confidence in God's love for us, we say, okay, Lord, in this calamity, how is your love going to show forth in bringing forth deliverance and victory in this situation? Because my heart tells me through your word that all things work together for my good because of you. That's having that trust, that absolute trust and confidence in God through his character. 
We have to understand his character. God is love. God is just. God is all-powerful. God is ever-present. And we can go on and on. God is merciful. The scripture says he's rich in mercy. God is forgiving. God is faithful. God has an expected end for you. That's who we can trust in. Not the lies of our flesh, not the lies of the enemy, not the the lies of religion, not the, the lies and bondages of law and legalism, but we can trust in God's character who is his very being. That's how we can have absolute confidence in God because we believe who he is. I'd like everybody to pray this prayer with me. If this has ministered to your spirit, let's seal this with this prayer. And now we'll have the prayer on the screen. And let's say this prayer together, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you that you have given us the shield of faith to quench every fiery dart of the wicked. We thank you, Lord, that as we trust in your character, as we trust in who you are, we will not succumb to the enemy's lies and deception. We will not seek alternative paths and methods that are contrary to your will for our lives. Instead, we will walk in righteousness and obedience to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God is a good God. And the relationship that he has established with us, it just blows my mind sometimes. We want you to be encouraged today that no matter what you're facing, God's character is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that no matter what you're facing today, just trust in who he is, and he will see you through. 